So this is a 1959 Gibson Les Paul Standard, AKA a burst. And these guitars from 1958 to 1960 are widely regarded as the holy grail of electric guitars. They are the most highly sought after, the most highly collectible electric guitars in the world. And they easily fetch prices into the six figures nowadays with prime examples going for close to or over half a million dollars in some cases. Now, if you know anything about electric guitars and their history, you know about the bursts. They've been played by some of the best and most iconic guitar players of all time, which is part of what's led to their popularity in the collector market today. But they're not just highly sought after showroom museum pieces. These guitars have a sound, they have a thing. And after getting my hands on this one at Carter Vintage Guitars a few months ago, I can tell you that that thing is pretty special. So in today's video, we're gonna take a look at the 1959 Les Paul in depth. We're gonna figure out why they're so highly sought after, what made them so special, and we're gonna try and find out what is the burst sound. <laughs> starts with Les Paul, right? So Les Paul was a tinkerer and he started experimenting putting pickups on guitars. He had uh, an Epiphone model, arch top, you know, hollow body, that he uh, modified by cutting it in half and then getting a uh, large piece of wood in the center and attaching the two halves of the body to that. And he called it the log. And then he put some crude, you know, early magnetic pickups on it and that was kind of like his first electric guitar. He presented it to Gibson. And at the time, Gibson weren't uh, very you know, enthused about doing a guitar like that. A few years later, Fender, of course, came out with their uh, broadcaster and that started you know, creating a stir. So Gibson started thinking about it uh, and that prompted them to develop the Les Paul model. So uh, a design team led by a man named Larry Allers design the Les Paul uh, pretty much as we know it. Once they had a guitar ready to present to Les Paul, they called him in and he, he saw it and he said, yeah, this is what I'm looking for. By 58, they did the first sunburst. So it was a figured maple top with a, a cherry sunburst on it. Still had, you know, the Keystone classic tuners. By 60, they added Grover. So over this period from 52 to 60, the Les Paul went through many, many changes. You know, they were trying to make it more commercially viable. They're adding all these features and uh, it, it, you know, was okay, but not successful enough to keep in the line. So by 61, they dropped the Les Paul as we know it and then came out with the SG. Now the story of the Les Paul guitar coming into development is one of my favorite stories in music history because you can tell that like Fender at the time, they were kind of figuring this whole thing out. In the early to mid 1950s, solid body electric guitars were kind of a new thing and there wasn't really a whole lot of styles of music that utilized this type of instrument other than things like Western swing here in the States and, and some jazz, for example. And in fact, initially the Les Paul uh, was, was marketed to a lot of jazz players, Les Paul being a, a premier jazz and finger style player of the time. If you've never heard Les Paul's guitar playing, I'd highly recommend you check it out. The dude was a monster. But a common misconception is the idea that Les Paul himself designed this shape and designed this guitar. He didn't. Pretty much every year from 54 to 60, there's a pretty major change somewhere in the Les Paul lineup, whether it be in the 
type of bridge they're using, the type of pickups, the finish, the, the tuners. Now, one of the big changes that Gibson implemented in 1958 was introducing the sunburst finish, hence the name Bursts. And a cool fact about the Bursts, if you look at mine, this is a modern 2019 reissue from Gibson USA. And you can see there's quite a bit of red around the edges. Now compare that to the Burst that I'm playing here at Carter Vintage, and you may notice they look completely different. The reason for that is the dye that Gibson used in the 50s to stain the wood, an aniline dye, was UV sensitive. So depending on how much time that guitar spent in the sun during its life would determine how much of the red burst is left around the edge of the guitar. This is what's known as a clown burst. And if you found a real 58, 59, or 60 with this level of burst around the edge, you can pretty safely say this guitar lived in its case most of its life. And this helps lend a little bit of personality to each one of the bursts. Many of them have their own names depending on who played them or where they came from or their history. One of my favorite bursts, for example, is the one that Jason Isbell currently owns, the Red Eye Burst. This was previously owned by Ed King of Leonard Skinner, and it's called Red Eye because of the small bit of red that's left right below the poker chip, the rhythm treble switch on the guitar. And the story on that guitar goes that it sat in a window for some time with a price tag hanging from the switch, and where that price tag was hanging preserved the die on that guitar. Now, if you're interested in learning more about bursts, there's a couple of books out there that really go into crazy detail documenting the ins and outs of all of these guitars. They really are historical artifacts at this point, uh, much like a, a Stradivarius violin or something like that. A lot of them really have a pedigree and have been documented well. I'll have some links in the description box down below to some of those books if you want to check them out. So with all the different iterations of the 1950s Les Pauls, what is it about that three-year period, 58, 59, 60. Why are those guitars the ones? Why are those the holy grail for so many players? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. They used, uh, and that, that was wood that was available to them. Now, Gibson at that time was in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and uh, there was a lot of furniture making and uh, cabinetry making and things like that. So mahogany was kind of readily available because of those other industries. With wood, it's a, a natural product, right? Mother Nature is making all this wood, and it can vary. It can vary from the old growth, it can vary from the new. So you, you can't say an absolute, just because it was old, is gonna be more resonant in the wood. Just because the wood's old, doesn't mean it's it's great too, because now- Now I was interested to ask Jim about this specifically, because I think this is part of the whole 1959 burst mythology. The story that I've always been told is that the guitars were built using old growth wood. The wood that Gibson was using at the time was two, 300 or more years old at the time that it was harvested. And the idea is this wood being older before it was harvested changed the tonal characteristics of those guitars specifically. Now. I'm not gonna make a claim in this video as to whether or not that's true. I think there's some evidence to support it and some evidence to not support it. So I think it's safe to say that it wasn't the wood in particular or on its own that made these guitars so highly sought after. So what about the pickups? In 58, 59, and 60, Gibson was using the famous PAF, patent applied for pickup in their Les Pauls. And there's absolutely no question that those pickups are a massive part of the burst sound. Now, I made a video about the PAF sound a few weeks ago that you can check out here. It's a really interesting story about how those iconic pickups were designed and came into being. But I don't think it was the pickups alone that made these guitars so highly sought after. I think what it really boils down to are the players. The guitar heroes, the legends that picked these guitars up, not necessarily in the late 50s when they were new, but about a decade later, in the mid to late 60s, when these guitars were out of production, 
not very highly sought after and were relatively affordable on the market as used solid body electric guitars. Now there's countless examples of famous players that have utilized bursts for their sound. I mean, Paul Kossoff and Peter Green and Billy Gibbons, Ed King. I mean, the list goes on and on, but I think there is really one player in particular that we can point to that sort of kicked off the popularity of the Les Paul in the mid 60s. And that was Eric Clapton when he was playing with John Mayall and the Blues Breakers on the famous Beano sessions. That sound, the tones that Eric got on that record are now famous and they literally helped launch an entire style of guitar playing that has lasted the better part of 60 plus years. Now, my friend Keith over at 5 Watt World made a fantastic video on this, uh, the Beano sound, the Beano record. I'll have it linked down below. I really, really highly recommend you go check it out. It's one of my favorite videos that 5 Watt World Keith has made. And in that video, he talks at length about Eric's burst and how that was key to the sounds that he got on that record. Yeah, it's like, it stays nice and uh, still really articulate. Also kind of does the... Uh, So after spending the day at Carter Vintage with that 59 Les Paul, I can confidently say that there is something special about those guitars. It truly is one of, if not the best sounding guitars I've ever played, but that's not true with all of the bursts. I've only ever played one other burst, and to be honest, that first one didn't really impress me very much. Just like any modern guitar made today, there's no guarantees that that particular guitar is going to be great. And it's also a subjective thing. What I think is great in a guitar you may not like. And after playing that guitar a few months ago and looking back on it now, I feel like I was caught up in some of the mystique or the hype of playing a burst, if you will. Nowadays, the guitars have gotten so unobtainable, so collectible, so expensive that mere mortals like myself can't really afford to own one. I mean, most bursts nowadays live somewhere in the $250,000 and up range. And so that brings into question, well, is the guitar actually worth that? Why would someone spend six figures on a guitar like that? And truth is, I can't answer that in this video. That like the tonality and the sound is a very subjective thing. It comes down to the person who might be interested in buying a guitar like that. But I can say that there is something to the burst sound. Part of it probably is the hype and the things that you play up in your mind when you're actually holding a guitar that's worth so much and is so rare. But there also is something to the sound, something that I find really special, really compelling. To me, it's not just about the wood or the pickups or the finish or the vintage. It's really about the players and the music that was created using those tools, using those instruments. To me, that is the burst sound. But... I want to know your thoughts. Have you ever played a 59 burst? Do you ever want to own one? <laughs> Does anyone who watched my channel, do, do you own one? I want to know in the comments section down below. Uh, if you want to support the channel, check out the links in the description box. You can find my new video course there, the complete Nashville number system course, as well as the tone course and all of my Helix presets, things like that, all available down below. You can also find a link to my second channel, Rhett Shull Studio, which is where I do things like more in-depth technical style videos, weekly live streams, long form interviews, things like that. You can also follow me on Instagram at Rhett Schull. And if you haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe here to my main channel and click that bell icon so you can be notified when I'm posting these videos and going live. I do want to say a big thank you to Jim DeCola from Gibson and Gibson Guitars for setting up the shoot and to Carter Vintage Guitars in Nashville, Tennessee for letting us shoot there all day a few months ago back in October and for letting us play their burst. That's Carter's burst. I, it may still be for sale. So if you're interested, I mean, check them out. Thank you guys so much for watching. My name is Rhett Scholl. Remember, there is no plan B. Actually, after my last video, I'm considering switching the little tagline at the end of these videos to stay curious, but I don't know. We'll see.